Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And then verse 5, it says, um, this is the New Living Translation, let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. And uh, when I was reading some commentaries on this verse, um, not only should we re remember that the Lord is coming soon, but we can ask for the Lord to be with us um, even now with his Holy Spirit. And I'm praying silently that he's uh, with me now as I'm pretty nervous. But uh, we'll go on to verse number six. Don't worry about anything, especially Pastor Blake. I just happened to glance over at one of his notes, and he was worried about what he was going to preach about today. Um, instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And this is a God is with us uh, continually, and we would like to praise his holy name for that. Lord, you're already here with us. Thank you so much. It's our awareness of you that needs to grow. And I ask you right, right now for an, a sense of the power of God coming through the word of God using a feeble instrument and then let it land in our hearts that is fertile, open, and ready. Always in the name of Jesus, amen. How many of you would like to learn how to worry? How many of you think that your life would be just a lot more meaningful if you had more time to worry? I mean, we can actually plan some days for worry. Like Monday, you could stress over the economy. Yeah, Tuesday, you could be worried about, well, you can make a list of all the reasons why by the end of the year, you may be unemployed. Wednesday is worry about health day. You know, you can just worry, and I mean, it's such normal stuff to worry about. You know that most people, it has been calculated, spends five years of their lives worrying. Five years. I don't know how they calculate that. I think that is pretty, a pretty low average, if that is an average. And I'm pretty sure that every single one of you here today has got something on your mind that is big, that is a weight, that is a burden, that is a worry. You can identify it in a split second. Maybe it is about school. Maybe it's about money. You know, is the, is the stock market going to crash? Seems like it started crashing in the last day or two. Is it in fact that I will have enough money by the time I reach my retirement age? Do I have enough money to fill my car with gas this month? That kind of worry is just on our minds constantly and constantly. You may be worried about, you know, some health issue, maybe a new health issue that has just popped up and now is on your mind. You thought you worked through the last health issue, worrying about it. Now the new one has just popped up. Maybe that is on your mind very much. I know maybe you're worrying about how your kids will turn out. I guarantee you there's some parents here that are thinking about that. You know, I mean, just think about parenting. Is it in the job description for parents? You know, parents want it. You must be able to go through sleepless nights, do unending pacing, and be able to bite your nails. Is that what parents are about? You know, all you have left then is stubby fingers, sore feet, and rings under your eyes, worrying as parents. And somehow we do. Yeah, I worried about my sermon. We worry about, worried about worried sermon about worry. I mean, it's just something about us that is so evidently true that worry is with us. Christians worry. And it definitely doesn't help for anybody to say, don't worry. Even though the Bible does say that. It actually uses those very words. Jesus, in fact, called one of his close friends uh, said this to this close friend. It was Martha. She was complaining that Mary was not helping her with the dishes. She was just enjoying a good friendship time with Jesus. And here comes Martha, and she's complaining about that. And here's Jesus' response to her. Martha, Martha, you are what? 
worry and trouble. It's like double whammy here about many things. Many things. How many is many? But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Do you know what that good part is that Mary had that Martha did not have and therefore led Martha to be the one who worries? What is that good thing? Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he sat down on a mountain and he had a large crowd in front of him. And he was teaching this crowd. This was a wonderful opportunity here at the beginning of his ministry to warn them about the deception of the Romans, to warn them about the cruelty of the Roman soldiers, to warn them about the, the hypocrisy of the priests in the temple. He could have warned them about the difficult days that are coming upon them. And he did talk about that later, but here at the beginning, the very first thing he wanted to clear up for them, the very thing that he wanted to address with them was the issue of worry. Why would Jesus do that? Why would that be so important for Jesus to be able to address that? So he says to them, I say to you, do not worry. Does that help? Don't worry. I'm going to call your name. Don't worry. Is that going to help? It has helped very few. But Jesus says, do not worry about what? Your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, and about what you'll wear today, what you're going to put on, about your body, and that's probably about the health and everything. Now, I don't think many of us have any worries about whether we're going to have food to eat, at least three meals today. We're not worried about that. But what would your list look like if Jesus was here and he's looking into your eyes and he is saying to you, don't worry about, how would he make that list? What would that list look like? You know pretty well. I mean, you can just zip through your mind, just flow through your mind, and you can come across these many bumps called worry, things you're worrying about. But Jesus says, don't worry about your life. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? I, I used to worry about that as a kid, and then they told me, you need to eat a lot of avocado, you'll grow. So I ate more avocado than I could find, and I think I got shorter after that. So why do you worry about clothing? Therefore, do not worry. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. How many times is Jesus using that word worry in this particular statement? Just in those few verses. He says it five times. Why is that so important to Jesus? Remember, he's talking to these people about the kingdom of God. And apparently in Jesus' mind, people who belong to his kingdom, who come into his kingdom, do not need to worry. Why? It's because they've discovered something else that displaces worry. That's what we need to discover. What is that? One thing we need to discover that would replace worry. What is that? You see, we are living in the last days, right? Destruction, deception, plenty of that. Delusions around us. It's going to be destruction and deception increasing again and over and over again. Danger, disappointment is going to get worse and worse. If we think it's bad now, it's going to get a lot worse. Because look at the words of 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. You should know this, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Maybe it feels like to you that your last days have already begun, that those very difficult days have already come. In Daniel 12, verse 1, there will be a time of trouble greater than any since nations came into existence. There are many verses in the Bible that just point to this final time of earth's history that is going to be intense, plenty to worry about. So what do we need to do to prepare for that time? Because if we're going to allow the end times, with everything that's involved there, to be a worry for us, it's going to worry us away from God. So what is it that I need to be doing now that's going to help me to face the worst possible stuff? The Bible says that the devil is going to impersonate Jesus Christ. He's going to do miracles, not appearing as devil, but he's going to appear as Christ doing miracles and deceive the world. Many times Jesus says, I want you to be warned against the deceptions of false Christ. 
You think you've been able to identify some false Christ by watching some TV programs, reading some books, going through channels. Let me tell you, the false Christ that you may have identified now is nothing compared to the false Christ that is ahead of us, where the miracles will make it seem like the Bible is wrong. It's going to make it seem like you're on the wrong track and others on the right track. They're going to be so persuasive, so difficult to deal with. And if you still have to deal with worry at that time, ostracization, persecution, rejection. You don't still have to deal with that at that time. What is it that we need to do now? Here's my thing. God actually is allowing whatever is worrying you right now, He's allowing it to come to your life now as a preparation to teach you how to trust Him instead of worrying about it so that when the real tough stuff comes, you will be ready. This is training time. Learning to trust Him in the small things, in the bigger things, in the huge things that do come right now. In the simple things, the more complex things, the ordinary day-by-day things, he is teaching us now to not be worried, to replace it with something else so that when the real tough time comes, we will not be swept off our feet by the tough things that we have not even dreamt about yet. So there's a purpose, a very definite purpose for that thing that is worrying you right now. The purpose is not to make you more worried. The purpose is to discover something that is vitally important in order to not just prepare you for the final days, but to make your life richer right now. What is that thing that we need to discover? What is that thing that we need to discover? Because whatever we trust most is our God. Whatever we trust most is our God. And worry somehow depletes trust in God. It is not compatible with trusting God. You cannot have both. You cannot be worried about stuff and trust God at the same time. Does that make sense? Silent church. Must be thinking. Pray God not sleeping. What is it? Worry undermines our trust in God. It really does. Martin Luther, the man who started the Reformation in 1512, October the 31st, when he nailed the 95 Theses on the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Started the Reformation. Rocked Europe. The church excommunicated him. The church put him on a black list. And everything that was involved for him to defend the word of God, to defend God, in fact, to defend the truth of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, brought so much opposition to him. It was like the armies of the devil were unleashed against Martin Luther, and he began to worry. His colleagues were bickering amongst themselves. He felt the huge responsibility of being a professor, being a pastor, being a father, and he turned him into a worry wart led to days of discouragement and depression. His wife, Katarina, watched all this, and she was getting quite concerned about her husband. So she dressed herself in black, as if she was in mourning. And she appeared before Martin Luther one day. And as he looked at her, He was startled, and he asked her, who has died? God has died, she said. Impossible. God cannot die. By the way you are acting, it must be obvious that God has died. That got his attention. Martin Luther thanked his wife went into his study and carved onto his desk the word vivid, a Latin word that means he lives. And every time this worry came upon him again, 
He would go there to his desk and he would repeat, vivid, he lives, creating a new pattern of thinking in his mind so that the more he thought about Jesus is alive, the less the worries could stick. So who is it that says there is no God? Atheists, right? Yeah. Well, who is it that says there is a God but acts like there isn't a God? The Christian atheist. Let that sink in. There's a man called Gruschel who wrote a book called The Christian Atheist. Startling. Very startling. In fact, in Matthew 6, verse 32, Jesus associates worry with the pagans. That's what the pagans do, Jesus said. Pretty serious. Because Jesus realizes that if we cannot learn to trust God and therefore dispel worry in the ordinary things of life today, the things that tear us apart, the things that bother us and allow, uh, we allow to bother us, we are not developing a secure, rooted, consistent, immovable, stable trust in God. And we will not be able to stand. When the final time comes. So how can the Christian deal with worry? If you'd like, you can choose the one thing that's uppermost in your mind right now about worry. And then apply what scripture is about to teach you. As we turn to Philippians 4 verse 6. And the first thing I want you to get from this passage is admit worry is unnecessary may have to do a lot of convincing of our minds that worry is unnecessary. For the text is, don't worry about how much? Anything. This is not just a sanguine statement Paul is making to the Philippian Christians. He literally means, don't worry about anything. Nothing is fixed by worry. Nothing. Now we can prove that by logic. Those who do those kinds of studies have found that 40% of the things that we worry about never come true. Worry it's going to happen, doesn't happen. 40% of those. 30% of the things that we worry about involve previous decisions that we cannot change. It's not going to make any difference whether we worry about it. Previous decisions that we are worrying about. 12% is about criticism from others who spoke harmly of us and they have the problem. But we worrying about it. And 8%, no 10% is related to our health, which only gets worse when we worry. And 8% of our worries could be described as legitimate causes of concern. Listen here. Well, less than one problem in ten. Less than one problem in ten. Is about a legitimate concern. Such things as the house is on fire. You have reason to be worried and get out. And that's a legitimate concern. Less than one in ten. So why do we worry? Well, life is hard. Problems come. We're not in control. That's true. But surely the God who created us is also capable to see to the details of the lives that he's given to us. How big is God growing in our minds? How much will we allow him to be God? See, worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. That Greek word for worry, 
means broken up in several directions. And that's what worry does. It sends us all over the place in all kinds of directions. It actually pulls us apart. And here's the best part of all. We cannot stop worry. It's the best part of all. Because that's the time when we can admit that worry is unnecessary. We cannot even change it. You try and stop worrying, then you're going to worry about the fact that you are worried. You cannot stop worrying.